the Idle Shepherd. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. In our last video we talked a lot about understanding the scepter from the pictures that scripture gives us and the example that scripture gives us so we have a better understanding of the scepter but it also gives us a better picture of the shepherd and the sheep picture and we definitely know that's used throughout scripture and it's amazing to see the interplay between the shepherd's crook, the scepter, and understanding the different roles of the shepherd and the sheep and it helps us better understand and see the picture of the tapestry of redemption. In particular, we looked at the scepter as a shepherd's crook and how that has long been used in ancient history as representation of a scepter, as a ruler. And we made mention of Moses, and he was a shepherd too as well, but he was also a ruler. He was a ruler in Egypt, and then he became the ruler of the Hebrew people. And he led the people out of Egypt. He became the Hebrew people's shepherd. That meant that Moses' staff that he carried, his rod, was, in a sense, the scepter of the Hebrew people. Exodus 4.2 And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. It's amazing to see this story when God is talking with Moses, and he's telling him that he wants him to speak to Pharaoh. But he's talking to Moses in his shepherd experience, and he's asking him, What is that that you have in your hand? And the Lord is bringing attention to the rod. And the rod is going to become very important. And it's amazing to see in these stories, particularly the story of Exodus, which is a type and pattern of what we are expecting, the rapture, the falling away, the gathering unto Shiloh. We are expecting a second Exodus. So when we look back at the first pattern of it, we see Moses, the shepherd leader, the shepherd ruler of the people, with a rod in his hand and attention being brought to it. And when we look up the word rod there in that passage, it even specifically has the idea that it can mean a ruling scepter, a ruling staff, a staff used to denote authority. And so again, keep this in mind. Moses is a ruler. He had royal experience growing up in the household of Pharaoh. And he was a shepherd too as well. God was bringing attention that the rod and the symbolic scepter that he had in his hand was going to become very important during this Exodus time. Jumping over to verse 17, And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. Very interesting how God draws attention, first of all, to the rod, to the scepter that is in Moses' hand. And he's telling Moses that Moses is going to be the leader and the ruler that is going to draw the people out of Egypt. He's going to be the shepherd that's going to gather them out of Egypt. And in this role, God brings attention to the scepter, to the rod, and God makes the connection that it's also going to be used for signs. The scepter is going to be used for signs related to the Exodus. And we're definitely reminded of Luke 21, 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And we can look up and one of the signs we see connected to our redemption, and that our redemption is drawing nigh, is the scepter, the ruling staff, the rod, connected with our exodus. We see the sign of the scepter, of the shepherd's crook, telling us that Shiloh, our great shepherd, is coming to gather his people. It also gives us a time frame that we are running out of time. We do not know the day or hour. We just know the approximate length of the shepherd's crook, which would appear to end around December 8th and 9th. But the gathering can happen any time before that. Now, I highly suggest you download the event study calendar. This gives you the best overview of how events overlap and are coming together in the days ahead. And we have December 8th highlighted just for your reference of that would mark a possible division. And that would be going totally by the opposition point mark. And right now we're on November 20th. And so that does not leave much time between now and then. And we could see several major prophetic events and pictures coming together right here in these days ahead. Primarily, the days of Hanukkah are going to be starting at the end of this very week. And some incredible pictures in that, especially connected with other shadow patterns we've already looked at with tabernacles and the temple. And then we see commemorative dates with Esther as well. Reminders of Hanukkah, that we need to be shining bright, and our beloved is expecting us to be ready to go with our lights burning, living wisely in light of his return. We have this reminder right in this time frame, almost right up to the very end of this border. 
And then we also are in the middle of the days of peace and safety warnings that we heard about last year and the biblical pattern of a year warning before destruction comes. We see that pattern in the book of Daniel. And so we have multiple things telling us that this week and next week are extremely important. We are running out of time. We do not know the day or hour. But we can see that the day of our redemption is drawing very nigh and at the doors. And we've been talking about the pictures of the shepherd and the sheep and how understanding these pictures gives us a better idea of the tapestry of redemption and what our beloved has done for us. But we also notice other important things in this passage too as well. Let's start at verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. Notice that Christ is painting a picture that there are other shepherds. There are other leaders that we give our attention to, and that do guide us, but not all shepherds are good. And as you read throughout scripture, you find how God gives different shepherds to guide his people. And some of those were in the form of judges and prophets and kings. But then he also sometimes allowed evil shepherds to come as judgment too as well. And sometimes shepherds were also in the form of religious leaders, such as in Christ's time there. But they weren't good shepherds either, and God gave a lot of rebuke to them. But notice the contrast that Christ is making. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And he's making a contrast, and by stating that there's a good shepherd, there is a statement and the understanding, and he also gives examples, that there are evil shepherds too as well. There are bad shepherds who do not have the best intentions for the sheep. Zechariah 11.15 And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off. Neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat, and tear their claws in pieces. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm, and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Woe to the idle shepherd. And notice that he told the prophet Zechariah to take the props, the instruments of a foolish shepherd, a simple shepherd. He said, Zechariah, I want you to use these props, the rod and the staff of a shepherd, to illustrate to my people that there is going to be an evil shepherd coming one day. And he uses the word idle shepherd, and it has the idea of worthless. Just like an idol, they are totally worthless. There's no value to them at all. There's going to be a worthless shepherd who would bring no good to his sheep, only evil. He would not care for the sheep at all. In fact, he himself would turn against the sheep and devour the sheep himself. And this is a picture of the Antichrist, who would one day come and be the idle shepherd. He would pretend to be the shepherd of the people, but he would turn on them. He would be an evil shepherd. And he paints a picture of how the shepherd does not care for the sheep at all. He does not use his strength to help the sheep at all. He actually turns against them himself. But notice how he distinguishes the idle shepherd. And he uses a picture of how the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. And so this is a picture of an idle shepherd, a worthless shepherd, who is also a picture of the Antichrist who is going to come and is going to portray himself as a good shepherd but he's really the idle shepherd. And this goes in context with the shallow prophecy and all the events that are going on right now with the messaging that we've seen, and we've briefly touched on this before, the enemy is expecting the Antichrist to make his triumphal entry. The one who's going to come onto the scene pretending to be Israel's shepherd. He's going to pretend to have their best interests in mind. He's about to come onto the scene and they know he's about to be unrestrained. But he's really the idle shepherd, that worthless shepherd, the evil shepherd. And the enemy has been getting ready for this because they have been watching the Shiloh prophecy too. They know the Shiloh prophecy is engaged. They understand the pictures of the shepherd. They understand who the good shepherd is. But they also understand the prophecy of the evil shepherd. 
And we cannot understand the Shiloh prophecy or the events that are going on right now without understanding more the shepherd picture, the shepherd's crook picture, the scepter picture, and the sheep picture. The more that we dig into these pictures, the better we have an understanding of what's going on right now. We'll have a better understanding of the times that we're at right now. We're at a threshold between two shepherds. The good shepherd is about to gather his sheep, which means the idle shepherd, the evil shepherd, will be unrestrained. And this is who they are expecting. This is who they're anticipating. And the reason they're anticipating them is because they have a love for evil. They have already rejected the good shepherd themselves. And so they are ready to embrace the idle shepherd. And where they are setting up all this messaging signifies that they know the Shiloh prophecy. They understand the concepts of these shepherds. They understand who they are rejecting too as well. Just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees knew full well that Jesus Christ was the promised redeemer. They knew he was from God. But they still rejected him. And we find the enemy today readying the way for the Antichrist, the idle shepherd who's about to come onto the scene. They know he's coming. They know he's about to step onto the scene. He's about to make his triumphal entry. And they are working their various messages in key locations with certain messaging and symbolism and choreography to send a very clear message that we can only understand and see when we understand the Shiloh prophecy and we fully understand the difference between the good shepherd and the idle shepherd. There's a lot of people who get upset about the arch and they have a vague idea of its connection to Baal and everything. And that's a lot to get outraged about. But when we understand the deeper picture of what it's truly connected to, we have a better understanding of why they're setting it up. They're not just setting up an arch just for the fun of it or to rile up people. No, they are sending a very strong message that they are expecting the idle shepherd to come onto the scene. We noticed the first time they set up the arch, they set it up at Trafalgar Square, right with the quatrefoils that signify the gateway to the underworld, right by the lions that flank the column, right where Nelson's column is. The placement was very deliberate of who they were expecting, and it was lined up to bring attention to particular figures and types and patterns. Primarily in this instance, someone who is a perfect pattern, a perfect shadow of the Antichrist, of the idle shepherd. We talked about Horatio Nelson, how he was significantly wounded several times in combat, losing the sight of his right eye during the campaign in Corsica in 1793, and later the amputation of his right arm. So if you're looking for someone to be a pattern to use in messaging about the Antichrist, Horatio Nelson is a perfect pattern. And we talked about how even his name means timekeeper, and that ties into what the Antichrist is going to be allowed to do for a short while. But even his heraldry that he used involved the palm tree and the phoenix concept, and he also fit the description of the idle shepherd of having distinctly blind in the right eye and missing his right arm, all perched on top of a capital modeled after the Temple of Mars, the Avenger. So the placement of this triumphal arch was very deliberate, and they're highlighting and bringing attention to the idle shepherd. And it is only by understanding the shepherd's crook, the scepter, the shepherd picture, the sheep picture too as well, only in light of the Shiloh prophecy too as well can we understand why they're bringing attention to someone who fits the pattern of the idle shepherd. Especially as we look at it more and we consider that they initially proposed to set up the gateway that went to Baal's temple. Instead of doing the triumphal arch, they initially published and sent out press releases that they wanted to set up the Baal Temple Gate. And they made up graphics and published it, and that got a lot of attention, of course, too. But then they supposedly backpedaled to making the triumphal arch. Now, I personally think that they intended to do that initially just to blend these two concepts together. Because they want the best of both worlds. It really is a Baal Gate in messaging and symbolism, and that's what they pushed first. But it is also a triumphal arch. It is going to signify when the idle shepherd makes his triumphal entry, just like the good shepherd did. And we've talked about how the organization that made this arch and has been publishing all this and sending out the messaging about the Baal Gate and now oh, the triumphal arch gate, they have right on their main page this mural of Theseus, whose name means the gathering, because they do fully understand the shallow prophecy. They know the good shepherd is about to gather his people, his redeemed sheep. Which then means that the idle shepherd will be unrestrained and he will come onto the scene. 
and the more we understand the biblical patterns and shadows about the scepter and the ruler and the Shiloh prophecy, the better we can understand and see what the enemy is doing and why they are using similar messaging to as well. The enemy on their main page is really pushing and promoting the idea of this figure called Theseus. And we mentioned how his name comes from the same root as Thesmos, Greek for the gathering. But Theseus himself was also a shepherd king. He was known as a shepherd king, and that's primarily where he got his name The Gathering from, because he gathered different groups together and unified them. And so they even understand the role of the shepherd king. And we talked about how Theseus is also linked to similar patterns of Heracles, also known as Hercules, who is known in mythology as slaying the Nemean lion. And Hercules was also another ruler who was a shepherd king as well. And there's a lot of association with Hercules with the shepherd's crook too as well. And even in the Greek mythology, Theseus and Heracles came together in one story. And so there's a linking of these two ideas together. When you see Theseus, it automatically brings up the ideas of Hercules too as well. They're very, very similar in patterns. But we also mentioned with Hercules... His role there is directly connected with the Leo constellation, the lion constellation. Because to the ancient Greeks, Leo represented the Nemean lion that was killed by the mythical Greek hero Heracles, who is known to the ancient Romans as Hercules. And so the lion constellation got its name Leo in association with Hercules, a shepherd king. But when you do more digging into it, the pattern and the story of the mythology of Hercules can be traced back to the story of Gilgamesh. And so the more you follow these patterns back, the closer it gets to Babylon. And then when you do more digging on the picture and the type of Gilgamesh, you find out he's really a picture of Nimrod, going all the way back to Nimrod. The pictures that are being pulled up and rehearsed with the archetypes of the people involved in their messaging, it all goes back to Babylon, it all goes back to the Tower of Babel, and it all goes back to the figurehead who is responsible for the rebellion. They're using echoes of that pattern and their archetype in their messaging today. We've talked a lot about how you have to understand what happened at the Tower of Babel and how a lot of the mystery religions and the secret orders and everything and even the other Babylonian religions such as Catholicism and all that, all of them stemmed from Babylon and particularly from Nimrod and the false worship that he set up with his wife too as well. It does all go back to Babylon. Even the worship of Molech and Baal, all that goes back to Babylon. And so when we see today they're using these figures that relate back to Nimrod and point to him as an Antichrist type and how he was the founder of Baal, when you see that that's what they originally wanted to set up right by the idol shepherd representation, you have a clear understanding that they know exactly what they're doing. They're highlighting the idol shepherd because they know exactly what it represents. In scripture and in prophecy and in the shallow prophecy too as well with the timing of where we are right now. They are expecting the idol shepherd. They are expecting the Antichrist. They are expecting the Nimrod figure. And the more we understand these patterns, the more we can see that the enemy knows exactly what time it is. And they know exactly what's about to happen too as well. Now we've mentioned before on the arch that they've set up the unique keystone and how there's a missing block there at the top. And that fits in with the ideas of Freemasonry, representing the keystone. They know their mystery of iniquity is almost done. They know they are at the finish line. They know they're about to be unrestrained. And the keystone is almost done. And that's also what the arch is representing. The mystery work, the mystery of iniquity that is leading to the idol shepherd. It's almost done. It's almost ready. They are about to hand over power. He is about to make his triumphal entry. The mystery of iniquity is almost done. And when you do some digging about Freemasonry, it doesn't take long before you find the connection of Nimrod and Freemasonry. It all goes back to Nimrod, Babylon, and the Tower of Babel. They know exactly what they're portraying with their messaging. They are anticipating the idol shepherd. They are anticipating the Antichrist to make his triumphal entry. And so again, when we look on the main page of the organization that has been making this arch and putting it up very precisely in certain locations with certain directions and everything, we can see a very systematic messaging going on for the idol shepherd, for the evil shepherd king that they are expecting. Pointing to Theseus, a shepherd king, connected with the scepter, pointing also to Hercules, who is also a shepherd king too as well in connection with slaying the lions and the meaning and the name of the gathering, which is also in connection with two shepherd kings. 
They know exactly the messaging that they're pushing out right now. This is why you also see other related events pushing very similar themed messages going on at the same time too as well. Because they are expecting their Nimrod figure to rise back up again. Their Antichrist, their idol shepherd. And you see it in connection with Baal. They're even emphasizing the Baal temple roof portions. And you're seeing this connection of a sudden push for Baal mementos all of a sudden. It's because they are connected. And you see it even in the news. Attention brought to that. And then they'll use those news articles to bring up history things related to Nimrod and Babylon and Nineveh and all that. There's a sudden surge bringing to mind the idol shepherd. The Nimrod type. The enemy is aware of the time, they know the prophetic time, they know the Shiloh prophecy. They have a distorted view of it, but they do know it is in play. And that we are reaching the end of the scepter, the end of the shepherd's crook. And when we look at all their messaging that they've done lately, just with this arch and the organization who's promoting the idol shepherd, we can see they understand what time it is. They know the church is about to leave, the ready bride is about to leave, is about to fall back. Make a military move so the next shepherd king can come onto the scene. And they've also messaged that there's going to be a third instance of the ark set up in Dubai right with the Babylon Tower of Babel picture too as well. Because that's what the Nimrod pictures, the shepherd king pictures, the gathering is pointing to. They are expecting a gathering, a new world order where they come together as one world. Their idol shepherd who's coming onto the scene is going to be the role of a shepherd king again. They are using all these pictures and patterns because they do understand what is about to happen. And it ties in with the Shiloh prophecy, who is the good shepherd. And once he steps in and gathers his people, then the idle shepherd will be unrestrained. When we look at where they set up in Trafalgar Square, we looked at the idle shepherd picture by Nelson. Very distinct messaging too as well. It very quickly came to mind who and what they're pointing out in scripture. They're pointing out the idle shepherd bringing attention to it, highlighting it, putting a triumphal arch right in front of it, because this is who they are expecting. And also at the same time, they're mocking the Good Shepherd, using the same patterns that he used when he came on the scene. The Good Shepherd arrived in Jerusalem, and he made his triumphal entry. He came as the Good Shepherd, as the King of Kings. And they're using the same messaging from Scripture, from a biblical context and prophetic point of view too as well, to put out their message, but also mock the true, the Good Shepherd. And we saw how the idol shepherd, the picture and pattern comes from Hercules and Heracles, who was a shepherd king and was very well known for that. And then how that traces back to Nimrod, the city of Babel, the site of the Tower of Babel too as well. And how it all goes back to Nimrod. He is the original idol shepherd. And also pointing to their third instance, where they are going to be evoking that exact imagery again, which again goes back to Nimrod, back to the Tower of Babel, back to when the imagination of their heart was only evil continually. And the world is definitely ripe for that today too. And of course, the Hercules imagery and pattern is also connected to the lion and the constellation too as well. And so they were evoking that because they expect their Antichrist to defeat the lion, Shiloh. That's what they expect. But with the idol shepherd, they're also messaging the timekeeper, the idol timekeeper, who's going to be allowed to mess with time for a while. But that's also a mockery of the good timekeeper, who does change times and seasons, and who holds control of time right now. And the enemy also used the Palmyra arch and all the palm pictures, and with Nelson too as well, to emphasize their palm idea of a phoenix returning, the Nimrod type returning onto the scene to finish the mystery of iniquity, the working of the mystery of iniquity. And of course, that is a mockery of the triumphal entry, which also had palms as well. And of course, that marked the triumphal entry of Shiloh, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is also marked by the constellation associated with the tribe of Judah. And we talked about the scepter connection too as well. The enemy has their messaging, but there also is a counterpart message that is mocked too as well. And we also saw how they put out the message of how the ready bride, the bride that was awake, and rising up, they will escape. And so for the enemy's perspective, that is a point marking the removal of a restraint. They know it's going to happen. So they will mark it. And it's something they're looking forward to. They're looking for the gathering of Shiloh's people. They know it is going to happen. But for them, it means the removal of a restraint. We're getting out of the way. We're getting out of their way. 
but they do know it is going to happen. And this is why they keep emphasizing the gathering. There is a gathering. There's actually two gatherings. Shiloh is going to gather his people, and then the idol shepherd is going to have his gathering too as well. So then not too long ago, we saw them set it up in New York City at the City Hall Park, right by a fountain that was very similar to the Trafalgar Square fountains. And why have they been setting up these arches on their organization website? They've been promoting and have a banner right at the top of Theseus, who's the shepherd king of Athens, and his name means the gathering. So they're emphasizing on multiple levels, in the physical realm and in the digital realm too as well, putting out messaging of they know the Shiloh prophecy is engaged, they know that it involves the good shepherd, and that it involves the idle shepherd, and they are expecting the idle shepherd. And we noted how they set up this arch timed with the Feast of Ingathering, the Feast of Tabernacles on the calendar that we've been following. Timed exactly, because they were making sure and emphasizing that you knew they are expecting a gathering. A gathering to get out of the way certain people, and then that will start and allow their gathering process. But we saw the mockery of the living water, how Christ came to give life, the Good Shepherd came to give life. And they were making a mockery of it by setting it up at that particular fountain. And also mocking the light of the world with the different candelabras there at the fountain. And then the connection with the Feast of Tabernacles with the lighting of the menorah lamps that lit the courtyards at night too as well. There's a lot of imagery that they're evoking to give their message. But they're also mocking the true message. Using it to promote the works of darkness, not the armor of light. And is here during this Feast of End Gathering where they also had the same messaging back at Trafalgar Square. Remember, the churches are identical, the two locations. And the messaging that they gave out at the first time is still in play, and they still have it on their website even right now, emphasizing the gathering. Because they know this is a time frame. They know we're approaching the end of the scepter. They know Shiloh is going to gather his people, and that time is running out. And so they're reminding their disciples to stay ready, to stay on point, and to be patient because the idle shepherd is about to come onto the scene. As soon as Shiloh, the good shepherd, gathers his people. And they're expecting that and anticipating that as the removal of restraint and the removal of light from the world. Those who are shining bright, the wise virgins, they are going to be removed from the world. Right after the rapture, right after the gathering, it's going to be very dark spiritually in the world for a while. And the works of darkness are going to be unrestrained like never before and all of a sudden too as well. It's going to get dark real quick. But you'll notice that the enemy is still giving out the same messaging of the gathering. Even at this time. Even though the Feast of Tabernacles is over, they are still pushing out the same messaging with Theseus of the gathering. And the shepherd king and the scepter. Again, because they do understand the Shiloh prophecy. But... That is because there is still one more event on the calendar between the Feast of Tabernacles and the end of the year. And that event is Hanukkah, which is connected with oil and lamps and burning brightly too as well. There's a lot of messaging that we see we are warned about in Scripture when we study Scripture. And when we study that, we have a better understanding of the time. What's going on right now? What is the enemy doing? What is going on in the heavens with the celestial sign? We have a better understanding of the time when we look into God's word, when we ask God for wisdom, and when we go forward in faith. So between the Feast of Ingathering and Hanukkah, there is a time expecting of the Ingathering. Because if you'll read the history of Hanukkah, it is about the Feast of Tabernacles being observed again because it was delayed. They weren't able to commemorate it at the proper time because there was a rebellion going on. And so when they finally got the victory, then they celebrated a late Feast of Tabernacles. There is another pattern and picture of the Feast of Tabernacles on the year calendar, on the calendar for the days ahead. There are two instances of these very important biblical pattern, and scripture brings our attention to both of them. But historically, it was also the time that the temple was rededicated too. After they had the rebellion and they secured the area, they cleansed the temple and they rededicated it. So there's a lot of patterns from the Feast of Tabernacles that we studied and that we looked at that are being repeated in the near future. And so all the pictures and shadows that we studied at the Feast of Tabernacles, all that's still in effect and still in place, so to speak, and Scripture even gives reference to it in the days ahead, particularly in light of the shallow prophecy with the Good Shepherd. When we look at the chapter that we were reading the other day about Christ talking about he was the good shepherd and he came 
to give his life for this sheep and how he has other sheep that he needs to bring into the fold. And it just happens to mention, and it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. So right in all this talk that Jesus is giving to the people about how he is the great shepherd, come to save his sheep, right in the middle of his talking about that, it just pauses and says, oh, by the way, it's the Feast of Dedication, the feast that celebrates when the temple was rededicated, Hanukkah. That's what this event is. And it's mentioning Jesus is at the temple celebrating and observing the Feast of Dedication. And while this is going on, he's talking about how he's the good shepherd. It's tying these two ideas together. And it's making this brief historical note so you do connect those ideas together. And so when we look back at everything that's going on right now, we can see why the enemy is also looking at and considering Hanukkah in the days ahead. Because they know it is just as important picture-wise as the Feast of Tabernacles, because it is the same thing picture-wise. All the pictures that apply to the Feast of Tabernacles apply to Hanukkah, and even more so because we are told to have our lights burning, and all the emphasis on the wise virgins. More emphasis and pointing to us as the bride were really pointed more toward the picture of Hanukkah than we are the Feast of Tabernacles, because the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, pulls in to it the Feast of Tabernacles, all the pictures from that are on top of what's already in Hanukkah. And so the enemy knows there's full expectation of the gathering happening up in that picture too as well, because that fits into a lot of what Christ told us to look for. Doesn't mean the rapture is going to happen right at that time, but we see that on the horizon, we know we're in the time right now. And so what it creates between these two instances of the Feast of Tabernacles is a time frame of when even the enemy is expecting the gathering. And that's why they still continue with their messaging. Also putting out the same messaging that later on, beyond that, they have their Tower of Babel picture. And they have that pushed out to the future. They have said late 2016 is when they're going to set that up. They still haven't stated when. But Hanukkah is starting this weekend, so so they know time is running out. They understand the pictures from a biblical perspective. They understand the timing of the Shiloh prophecy with the Good Shepherd, the Scepter, the Shepherd's Crook, and how that also will involve the idle shepherd who will be unrestrained as soon as Shiloh gathers his people. So they have an understanding of the time frame too as well. And they are expecting not the gathering necessarily of Shiloh's people. They are expecting what comes after that. Because that means their Tower of Babel efforts are going to be renewed. Their wickedness and the imaginations of their heart only evil continually. That is going to be renewed to a whole new level. And once again, they're going to try to ascend to the heavens. Not necessarily with a physical building, but with an effort and with technology and means. They know that as soon as the falling away takes place, the military move by Shiloh gathering his people, that the idle shepherd will be unrestrained and that it's going to be a very perplexing time. There's going to be events happening because it is a war. The red horse of war is coming onto the scene. There's going to be a great sword given to it. And there's going to be a lot of death and destruction. And the Bible even tells us, Jesus told his disciples plain up, it's going to be a very perplexing time, and the powers of heaven are going to be shaken. There's going to be things happening during that time that the idle shepherd's going to be accomplishing that are going to be completely out of the normal. They're going to be trying to ascend into heaven and to take the throne. And you'll remember that the Bible mentions the Revelation 12 sign and how it makes a note of a particular marker when there is a war in heaven. There are some significant events going on during the tribulation time period. But the Revelation 12 sign is going to mark when that war is over and Satan is kicked out of heaven for the last time. He's kicked down to earth and he's very angry because his playtime is up and his time is very short. And so as the idle shepherd, he will then turn on the Hebrew people and turn to devour them. They fully understand what time it is prophetically. They understand the shallow prophecy. And they understand that time is very short. If you haven't yet, definitely download our Shiloh booklet where we talk about I love these signs come together, including the Revelation 12 sign, and how these signs are all about the sign of the king's coming. And the more we study and look at the shepherd picture, the shepherd's crook and the scepter and the sheep, the more we study this, the more we have a picture of the tapestry of redemption, what our shepherd has done for us, what our gratitude toward our shepherd should be, and also that we are expecting a gathering by our shepherd our good shepherd. We are expecting a second exodus. We are expecting to be led 
by the shepherd's crook out of this world. And I am reminded of Exodus 14:15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on the dry ground through the midst of the sea. At the Exodus, right at the dividing of the sea, we find some very interesting pictures for us. God told Moses, Go forward in faith. There are things you are not going to understand, but I'm going to work it out as you go forward. I already know what's going to happen. You go forward in faith. Tell the people, go forward in faith. And this is a message for us today. There's a lot that we don't understand. But we listen to his call. We listen to the midnight cry. And we go forward with what we do know we should do. And also notice how Moses was told to lift up the rod. He was to hold it up in the air. Hold that shepherd's crook. Hold up that scepter as the ruler of the Hebrew people. Hold it up in the air, in the heavens, so to speak, and that was going to open the sea and divide it and make a way for them to go through. And likewise, we are expecting our exodus. We can look up and we can see the scepter held up for us, reminding us that a redemption is drawing nigh. And we know that one day the door of heaven is going to open and God is going to say, come up hither, come up hither. And as we see the scepter held up for us, this is our expectation. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Your shepherd is drawing nigh to gather his people. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Let us go forward. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Go ye out to meet him. Go forward. Go out to meet the bridegroom. The hour is very late. It is very dark in the world too as well. There are things we do not know, but we have heard the midnight cry. Go out to meet him. And so we trim our life. We examine our life as we have expectation of our bridegroom and our redeemer, the good shepherd returning to gather his people. We make ourselves ready. We shine bright. We live in light that he's returning and we shine even brighter. And as we see the day approaching, we encourage each other and provoke one another into love and the good works because we can see and tell that our redemption draweth nigh. And the more we study the picture of redemption, the more we are excited to see it. He has taught us we will see it drawing nigh and that we should make ourselves ready as we see it and that we should encourage each other to be ready, to be shining bright. Definitely download the material, rehearse it, study the story, the picture, the tapestry of redemption that is coming together right now, the story of our Redeemer the story of our shepherd, the story of our beloved who is coming to gather his people. We know the hour is late. We know time is short. So let us rise up. Let us trim our lamps. Let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light and let us shine bright, going forward, going out to meet the bridegroom halfway, serving Christ first and highest above all else. Maranatha.